our program today is going to be a very basic overview of the federal bankruptcy process. And for some of you, we suspect it's going to be a refresher, maybe even elementary. But for others of you, it may be a very basic introduction to a whole new world. We have really three main objectives for our program. The first is to introduce you all to the federal bankruptcy code in general and to some of the principles that govern the bankruptcy process. Next, we want to help everybody to better understand how a bankruptcy proceeding may further or detract from a particular objective that a party has. And finally, finally, last but not least, we're trying to help everyone to identify when it's appropriate to take action to protect rights and interests in response to a bankruptcy proceeding. Just a brief comment on nomenclature. Bankruptcy does have its own glossary, and Brian and I are going to be referring to the key players in the process in a particular way. When we refer to a debtor, we're talking about the party that has sought relief under the bankruptcy code by the filing of a petition commencing a case under one of the available chapters. When we talk about a creditor, we're talking about the party that's owed the obligation, uh, owed an obligation from the debtor, whether it's a monetary obligation or otherwise, and that claim may be a secured, unsecured claim or have other characteristics. With that overview then, let's turn to the basic whys and the wherefores of bankruptcy. What is bankruptcy? Why does it exist? What are the basic objectives of a bankruptcy? As Brian will discuss in a little bit greater detail, bankruptcy is a constitutionally conferred right or remedy. And when Congress passed the bankruptcy laws, what it was doing was simply giving effect to the Constitution. There are really two basic principles that underlie the bankruptcy process. The first is accomplishing fair allocation among creditors of assets of a financially distressed party. And the second is affording a fresh start for the financially troubled party. As we run down the whys and the wherefores of the bankruptcy process in this program, we're going to continue to bump into these two concepts, which are really recurring themes throughout the bankruptcy code and the underpinnings of that remedy. It's a lot easier to understand the bankruptcy process when you keep these two, these two you know, basic primary goals in mind. Um, for example, the fair allocation of assets explains why we have an automatic stay or a timeout from collection activity immediately upon the filing of a bankruptcy. And the discharge that an individual gets upon properly complying with the bankruptcy process, that get out of past debts free card, if you will, is an example of the fresh start objective that's at work. So in essence, what the bankruptcy code is endeavoring to do is prevent the demise of an ailing debtor to afford that debtor the opportunity to produce again, and in all in hopes that the debtor and creditors alike will fare better from that course in the long run. So how are the bankruptcy's basic goals achieved? Brian's going to walk us through the options available to a debtor to get on a more solid financial footing in, uh, as we advance in this program. But just briefly, the bankruptcy laws allow a debtor uh, the opportunity to bring all the creditors, uh, all of its creditors to one forum, that's the bankruptcy court, to work through that debtor-creditor relationship. And as the debtor moves forward in the bankruptcy court under the desired chapter of the bankruptcy code, it's either going to liquidate its non-exempt assets and repay the claims of its creditors with those proceeds of disposition, or it's going to continue in possession of its assets, it'll restructure its debts, and then pay the pre-filing indebtedness through a plan of reorganization. So at this stage, I'm going to turn over the floor to Brian, who will explain the basic anatomy of the bankruptcy laws and the process. Thanks, Cheryl. While there certainly is um, regulation at the federal level for the debtor-creditor relationship, um, primarily the law of debtor-creditors is, is state law, um, What, it, with a significant exception being, of course, the, the bankruptcy code, which is um, uh, initially uh, part of the Constitution. It's uh, the bankruptcy clause in the Constitution is what initially uh, forms the basis for all of all of the bankruptcy law in in the United States. The United States Constitution uh, empowers Congress to establish uniform law across all the states um, on on the subject of of bankruptcies. Um, there was really no debate in, in including that clause. It's considered part of um, the power to regulate um, interstate commerce. The idea being that you know we couldn't have debtors fleeing from state to state. Now in Enacting uh, this uh, this bankruptcy um, clause, the United States Congress uh, passed Title 11 of the United States Code, which is the bankruptcy code. Um, 
And this is really an overlay over that state law that really governs the law of property, of liens and claims that might be brought in a bankruptcy case. There are several chapters that I wanted to highlight for um, the people at this presentation, and that's the basic um, chapters that uh, debtors may uh, file for bankruptcy under. Um, chapter 7, and I think it's important to have these just because when you're presented with a bankruptcy issue, it is important to know kind of where where these cases are going um, in general. And, and you'll hear, hear about a Chapter 7 or a Chapter 13, and I think it's important to at least know generally what those what those might mean. Uh, a Chapter 7 case is a liquidation, and this is what uh, the case that's typically filed by most individuals. It's certainly the most common bankruptcy case. And this is a liquidation in which a trustee is appointed and takes possession of all assets of the debtor. Um, if the debtor has assets that are worth um, enough for for administering an estate, the trustee will uh, liquidate the assets and provide for distribution to creditors through through a sale of those assets. Um, the other one that's typically used by individuals, the other chapter that's typically used by individuals is going to be Chapter 13. Um, and I have on the slide wage earners. It's also the one where they might have a payment plan that will last for three to five years. And instead of being a liquidation of assets, the plan uh, in a Chapter 13 case is really a dedication uh, of the future earnings of the debtor towards the repayment of creditors' claims. The Chapter 11 um, is the one that's typically used by companies uh, to reorganize. It can be used by individuals, individuals that may have uh, a higher net worth or significant debts, uh, may reorganize under Chapter 11. In a Chapter 11 case, this is the this is the case where a a, a debtor will file or f file for bankruptcy, and then they will put forward a plan. And once the plan is confirmed, there's, there, there'll be either a liquidation through that through that process or potentially a reorganization of the company, and, and the company will emerge from bankruptcy. Uh, the two other chapters, they're certainly much less used that I also wanted to highlight is a Chapter 9. In chapter 9s I wanted to mention mostly because of the Detroit filing and the fact that they've um, that's certainly got in the news more recently. Um, it is it is a very little used chapter, but that's available for municipalities, um, provided that the state that the municipality is located in authorizes a municipality within that state to file for bankruptcy. Um, the other one is Chapter 12. Chapter 12 is for family farmers and fishermen. It's kind of a hybrid between an 11 and a 13, um, primarily because the farmers and fishermen would have seasonal income instead of regular income that could be paid through a 13 plan. They would also have significant uh, debt that would not permit them to file under Chapter 13. The process for a Chapter 12 plan is similar to an 11 in that it's much more flexible, but it's also similar to a 13 in that creditors don't actually get a vote on a Chapter 12 plan. So those are the primary uh, chapters that uh, a debtor can avail themselves under the bankruptcy code. Uh, the commencement of the case um, is done, and I'm going to turn that over to Cheryl. Thanks very much, Brian. A bankruptcy case under one of the available chapters that Brian just talked about is commenced by the filing of a petition under that particular chapter with the bankruptcy court. The filing of a petition is a pivotal event. Various rights and remedies will flow from the date of the filing of the petition. Certain relief is afforded, for example, immediately upon the filing of the petition. We've alluded to the automatic stay that arises upon the filing of the bankruptcy, and that is a prohibition against collection activity, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later. Additionally, once the petition is filed, the universe is divided into pre- and post-petition worlds. The property of the debtor that exists at the time of the filing of the case is an estate. And this estate, for example, in a Chapter 7, subject to any exemptions that the debtor may have from collection, is available for liquidation, and the proceeds of that liquidation would then be used to pay pre-bankruptcy claims. Claims a debtor incurs after the filing of the case or in the post-petition world, if you will, um, such as administering the, case, the cost of administering the estate, those are post-petition obligations of the estate, and those uh, claims that arise may be entitled to certain priority payout from the assets of the estate, and that's unlike claims that arise of the same nature that would arise prior to the bankruptcy filing. 
A case can be commenced on either a voluntary or an involuntary basis, and a voluntary case is one that the debtor commences of its own accord by the filing of the petition. The involuntary bankruptcy case proceeds at the behest of one or more of the debtor's creditors, and it's worth talking a little bit about the involuntary bankruptcy remedy because it's a rather unique remedy with unique features. This is a remedy that's afforded to unsecured or undersecured creditors of the debtor, and the basics of that remedy are set forth in Section 303 of the Bankruptcy Code. An involuntary proceeding can uh, be either a Chapter 7 or a Chapter 11 case, and again, likewise, it's commenced by the filing of the petition, but in this instance, the filing takes place um, at the doing of the requisite numbers of creditors. Um, certain parties cannot be the subject of, a, of a, an involuntary bankruptcy proceeding. For example, a charitable institution or a family farmer cannot be an alleged debtor or debtor in an involuntary bankruptcy proceeding. To prosecute an involuntary bankruptcy proceeding, there needs to be certain creditor and debt thresholds that are met. Uh, if the debtor has less than 12 creditors, then it only takes one unsecured creditor with a debt of at least $14,425 to attempt to place that debtor into the bankruptcy. If the debtor has 12 or more creditors, then it takes three of those creditors with unsecured claims in the aggregate of at least $14,425 to place that debtor into an involuntary bankruptcy. There's some additional criteria that also have to be met to pursue an involuntary bankruptcy. For example, there needs to be a showing that the debtor is not paying debts as they come due. And each of the petitioning creditors, you know, whatever number is required to pursue the involuntary, needs to have a liquidated non-contingent claim against the debtor that's not subject to a bona fide dispute. And essentially, an involuntary bankruptcy is a fairly extraordinary remedy. Uh, you're talking about putting a party before the bankruptcy court against its will. And so that remedy is afforded only to those creditors that have indisputable claims. Um, the debtor, the alleged debtor, I should say, is entitled to dispute the involuntary bankruptcy petition or the debtor can consent to that relief. Also, if the debtor wants to seek such relief, it can require a petitioning creditor through court process to post some sort of a bond and to indemnify the debtor from the harm that might uh, result from seeking the involuntary uh, bankruptcy. If the creditors are successful in the pursuit of the involuntary case and the alleged debtor becomes a debtor and will proceed and be submitted to the bankruptcy process, if the involuntary petition is successfully controverted by the debtor, then the case is dismissed. Uh, it's worth noting that there is some risk in, in moving forward with an involuntary, not just uh, the indemnity and, and bond that I mentioned, but also uh, if the case is dismissed and it's deemed not to have been pursued in good faith, then the petitioning creditor or creditors could be liable for the actual damages proximately caused by the filing. And if it's shown that the creditor sought the relief with intent to harm the debtor, then there may be punitive damages that could be awarded. In, in uh, concluding this discussion on involuntaries, it's worth noting that this remedy may be particularly appropriate if the creditor body thinks that the debtor is hiding or mismanaging assets. By bringing the debtor into the jurisdiction of the bankruptcy court, the debtor's affairs then become subject to the disclosure process that's associated with bankruptcy. And also in a Chapter 7 situation, the debtor then would lose um, control of its affairs and a Chapter 7 trustee would administer the bankruptcy, or the, excuse me, the, the debtor's uh, property in the bankruptcy. Also, if it's a Chapter 11 involuntary, the creditor body could pursue a trustee to administer the the affairs of the debtor that's in the reorganization proceeding. And then finally, um, the involuntary bankruptcy can be a vehicle to recover preferential transfers. It's, it's um, those tools, I think, that are available in bankruptcy that may make it an option for collecting a judgment. Um, if you are a judgment creditor, um, I would always consider an involuntary bankruptcy as a potential tool for collecting that judgment. Um, certainly there are risks involved, and it's it's actually not easy to put somebody in an involuntary. It's an extraordinary remedy. And and even though um, the, the dollar amount threshold is not enough, it, it sometimes can be challenging to gather up three creditors that would be willing to petition somebody into bankruptcy. Um, so I do always consider it as a potential judgment tool, especially where um, the debtor may be acting in a way where they're hiding assets or transferring assets. Um, where they're just uh, particularly challenging and, and trying to collect the judgment against them is certainly one tool that's that I, I consider. Yeah, that's right. I think, Brian, you're, you've made the point before that when you have a judgment creditor, you at least hopefully meet the criteria of having an undisputed debt. You've had a court determine that uh, 
that obligation and you're at least a little bit further down the road to being an appropriate petitioning creditor. So with that, we're going to turn the floor back over to Brian and he's going to talk a little bit about uh, case administration and who the players are in the, in the bankruptcy process. It's part of um, the disclosures that, that Cheryl mentioned that makes the involuntaries uh, potentially helpful. Um, immediately following the filing of the bankruptcy, or usually with the petition, but um, certainly within a short period after the petition is filed, the debtor is required to make certain disclosures under oath. They're required to file schedules and statement of financial affairs. The schedules would include a list of assets. It would also include a list of the, the creditors. Um, so that's kind of your first glimpse into what, what uh, assets are available. In addition, the Statement of Financial Affairs is kind of a recent, uh, recent look back at the debtor's financial situation. It will include disclosures relating to uh, transfers that the debtor has made within the 90 days prior to the bankruptcy filing, which could potentially be avoided and recovered for the benefit of, of other creditors. Uh, not long after the bankruptcy filing, a 341 meeting is scheduled. Now, the 341 meeting or the meeting of creditors is, again, an opportunity to ask the debtor about uh, the financial affairs of the, of the debtor um, as well as the debtor's assets. The debtor has to come to a 341 meeting and is placed under oath and is asked questions by the bankruptcy trustee and can also be asked questions by creditors. Uh, usually this is a fairly short proceeding um, that's that's uh, before the bankruptcy trustee is not it's not in the bankruptcy court it's a it's essentially a, a very short deposition relating to uh, asking questions about the schedule statement of financial affairs or other financial issues that might affect the bankruptcy estate uh, this is the first kind of opportunity to schedule in the 341 meeting the first opportunity to identify assets that might be disposed of um, or liquidated by a trustee for the purpose of making distributions to creditors. It's also the first opportunity really to kind of evaluate the potential, if you're, if you're a creditor looking from the outside, it's the first opportunity to evaluate the potential for that debtor to reorganize their affairs and uh, to kind of see uh, a glimpse at where the bankruptcy case may be going. The bankruptcy, case, bankruptcy cases, as Cheryl mentioned, kind of has its own nomenclature, and I think that, that it's important to understand who some of the parties are that, that might appear in a bankruptcy case, just because especially some of them may be kind of closely uh, related, but there, there are certainly differences that I wanted to highlight. Uh, the U.S. trustee is actually a government uh, agency um, within the Department of Justice that is really charged with generally monitoring the bankruptcy process and making sure that the bankruptcy process is being conducted consistent with the bankruptcy code and, and federal federal laws. The U.S. trustee will appear certainly in matters, although more often than not um, they, they don't um, unless there's an issue that's important for them or if they feel like the bankruptcy case has um, taken a turn uh, for the worst. Um, they do oversee the, the case trustee program. So a Chapter 7 trustee, that's the trustee that is appointed um, for to take possession of the assets of a debtor and to liquidate them and then distribute uh, any proceeds from those assets to creditors. So that's in a Chapter 7 case. That's the trustee that's appointed. In a Chapter 13 case, a trustee is appointed that will um, collect and, and distribute uh, the debtor's future earnings consistent with the a plan, a Chapter 13 plan that's confirmed for the repayment of creditors. In a Chapter 11 case, the, more often than not, the debtor remains their own trustee. They really kind of put on another hat as a trustee, and, and that's referred to as a debtor in possession. Um, it's also referred to, in short, it's called a DIP. Uh, a lot of people will hear about DIP loans. That would be a loan that is made to the debtor in possession uh, post-petition to essentially finance the ongoing operations of the company. In a Chapter 11 case, typically the debtor uh, remains in possession of those ap assets and operates the business uh, during the bankruptcy case, uh, even though they, they may be the parties that um, have put themselves into a position where they had to file for bankruptcy, 
uh, usually they're still the same parties that are, are best able to understand the business, continue to operate the business, and hopefully maximize value that's going to be available for, for payment to creditors. Uh, kind of as a, a counterweight to that, in many Chapter 11 cases, uh, there is going to be a committee of creditors that is appointed by the U.S. Trustee's Office. If there's sufficient interest from creditors, usually the committee will consist of three to five creditors that will um, essentially serve to represent the interests of creditors in general. Oftentimes they'll hire their own attorney and the case will proceed forward, oftentimes with um, significant involvement and influence in the case by the creditors committee and the creditors committee council. Um, I think Cheryl is going to now speak about one of what I consider to be one of the most important things um, of the bankruptcy code, and I think it's a, an important takeaway, especially for those that, that don't deal with bankruptcy regularly. If you get a bankruptcy case in, I think that this is probably the most important uh, thing to take away from this, uh, from this presentation. Thanks, Brian. Uh, I am going to talk about the automatic stay. We've alluded to it, and now here we are uh, to the meat of that, that uh, uh, particularly unique attribute of bankruptcy. This is a federal court directive or an injunction prohibiting action against the debtor or the debtor's property, and it arises automatically upon the filing of the bankruptcy petition. The thrust of this injunction is to assure, again, the fair allocation of assets. We talked about that particular theme, and this is a timeout. It's an opportunity for the debtor to formulate an orderly approach to financial restructuring and avoid preferential treatment of creditors that might occur outside of bankruptcy without that uh, timeout and, and uh, Stay, if you will. Um, the scope of and the exceptions to the automatic stay are set forth in Section 362 of the Bankruptcy Code. And um, some of the actions that are stayed, we set those forth on the slide. Um, as a general rule, these include any effort to collect a debt or to enforce action against the debtor's property. And there are certain actions that are not stayed. And essentially, we put those forward on the slide. And without going into great detail, these typically involve actions, um, the exercise of police power. If a debtor is engaged in any sort of illegal or harmful activity, then the bankruptcy really shouldn't be used to preclude efforts to contain or pu uh, punish that kind of activity. There are certain other actions that are often not stayed, and these are the kinds of actions that maintain the status quo. For example, um, continuing perfection of a UCC filing that's already of record but nearing lapse under state law to file your continuation statement isn't a violation of the stay. Also not stayed is something known as an administrative freeze that a creditor might place on a deposit account to preserve a right of set off. And, you know, right of set off is the creditor's rights to access funds in its possession that the bankruptcy code actually treats as a secured claim. So a creditor may take action to prevent the debtor from withdrawing those funds in its possession after the bankruptcy to preserve the set off rights, but it has to promptly seek relief from stay from the bankruptcy court to actually set off. So the freeze is viewed as a status quo uh, permissible protective move, but the set off is going to require court approval. With respect to ability to get relief from stay, there are situations where a party in interest, including a creditor, may wish to obtain and have grounds to obtain relief from the automatic stay so it can exercise its state law remedies. The code affords particular bases for uh, seeking relief from stay. The first is known as cause, and uh, including lack of adequate protection. Adequate protection is a um, really not a term that's defined in the code, but uh, the lack of insurance would be an example of, of cause. If a creditor's collateral is not under insurance, then there would be cause for concern and lack of adequate protection for that collateral, and the creditor could move forward uh, with the bankruptcy court and seek to get those stay lifted so that it can enforce its state law rights against that particular collateral. A second basis for relief from the stay is uh, something a secured creditor would perhaps want to pursue in a Chapter 7, and that's lack of equity in the property at issue and no ability of the debtor to reorganize. If a creditor doesn't have value in the property over and above the debt, and it's really not hanging on to that property with any purpose to reorganize, then there's no reason for that debtor to, to keep the creditor at bay and to not allow that creditor to get relief from the automatic stay to exercise its state law rights against the property. 
With respect to um, violating the stay, uh, if a creditor has taken action to enforce its rights, or any party, not just a creditor, but if action's been taken uh, without knowing of the bankruptcy filing, that action is typically void, which means that it's really of no legal effect. It's as if it never happened. So, for example, if a creditor has uh, gone ahead and conducted a foreclosure sale under state law and even recorded the deed um, to transfer that asset of record to the buyer, um, that action is going to be a do-over. It doesn't count, and um, it's typically void, so it has no effect. Sometimes a, an action in violation of a state can be voidable, but that's not the usual rule, and if it's voidable, the debtor would have to come seek to set it aside. But again, I, I know of very few situations where a violation of the state is deemed to be voidable. And then finally, it's worth knowing that if you do violate the stay, um, actual damages could be assessed under certain circumstances for the harm caused by that uh, violation. And if the violation is willful in some form or fashion, you know about it and you proceed knowingly um, to, to violate the stay, then punitive damages may be assessable against the party that violated the stay. And, and I think that's why it's important once a creditor receives a notice of bankruptcy filing they know about this. They know about the bankruptcy. Any actions taken after that uh, can be deemed willful, um, and so there's potential damages there. So it's important once a creditor receives a notice for bankruptcy that they really do kind of need to flip the switch off on all collection activities. Um, which is why I say this is one of the more important aspects of the presentation today. Is just if um, if we can make sure that creditors take appropriate action to at least take a pause on their collection activities once they receive a bankruptcy notice. I think that that's, that's a very important um, aspect of the bankruptcy code, and it should be respected by creditors, and, and hopefully it will be um, that, way, that way the creditors themselves don't, don't get themselves in trouble. That's, that's uh, advice well taken. <laughs> We're going to switch gears a little bit now and take another uh, a look at another unique attribute of bankruptcy, which is how it allows the debtor to treat its pre-bankruptcy agreements. To the consternation of many, bankruptcy offers the debtor the opportunity to cherry pick among its agreements. And essentially, by following certain rules set forth in the bankruptcy code, the debtor can retain or assume an agreement, even though at the time of the bankruptcy filing, that agreement may have been in default and could have been terminated under state law. And the debtor might also be able to assign its rights under an agreement, even though that agreement may include an assignment provision. Alternatively, the debtor might also be able to shed or reject its pre-bankruptcy agreements and move on from them without having to pay possibly the full amount of the damages that would have been due outside of bankruptcy court. The rules for continuing or assuming a contract or disavowing or rejecting a contract are set forth in Section 365 of the Bankruptcy Code, and only certain types of agreements are subject to assumption or rejection in bankruptcy, and these are known as the executory contract and the unexpired lease. The executory contract is one where significant performance remains due from each party to the other under the agreement. Examples of an executory contract may include a supply agreement or an insurance agreement. There may, it may be easier to understand really what an executory contract is by, by understanding what it's not. An example of a contract that would not be executory is one where a party has to deliver an item. And upon that party's delivering the item, the only return performance then would be payment for that item. Um, if, uh, you know, in that instance, then, if a bankruptcy is filed after one party has performed, there's no longer open performance on both sides of the agreement. The performance remains due from only one party. So under those circumstances, that agreement can be impacted by the bankruptcy. The performing party that wasn't paid has a claim, but that's not an agreement that could be assumed or rejected in, in bankruptcy. Um, the unexpired lease, as the name suggests, is one that remains um, with a term on it at the time of the filing of the bankruptcy. So really, in sum, um, a contract that has no further performance remaining or a lease that's expired or terminated in bankruptcy is really not a dynamic enough relationship for the rules of assumption and rejection to uh, apply. And if a contract is assumed, it's then a binding obligation of the debtor's estate. Uh, if the contract's rejected, then it's typically t treated as one that's breached as of the date of the filing, and there may be pre-petition damages that can be asserted against the debtor's pre-petition assets, typically on an unsecured basis. 
So we're going to take a brief look at the assumption process and what that entails. If a debtor wants to continue to receive the benefits of the contractual relationship and possibly assign it to a third party, then it needs to take steps to, to do so in a timely manner. And as we've said before, the continuation of that contractual relationship and bankruptcy jargon is the assumption of the contract. Agreement has to be assumed before it can be assigned to a third party. In bankruptcy, there are certain deadlines that the debtor has to keep in mind if it wants to assume certain types of agreements. For example, um, a, a commercial lease in a Chapter 11 case has to be assumed by the debtor within 120 days after the bankruptcy is, filing, is filed or within an additional 90 days if the debtor um, gets an extension up to the 210 days that are allowed under the bankruptcy code to assume the, the commercial lease. If the debtor doesn't take action within the deadline, then that lease is essentially deemed rejected and the debtor needs to turn to the counterparty to the contract and get its consent to assume, which consent may not be forthcoming. Um, in a Chapter 7 case, there's some, somewhat of a similar deadline in that a lease of residential property is deemed rejected 60 days after the case filing. So one of the um, key things in assuming a, a lease is making sure you don't blow the a deadline to do so. Um, the process for uh, assuming a, a, a contract is that the debtor has to file a written motion with the bankruptcy court, needs to serve that motion on the counterparty, and give that counterparty an opportunity to object to the assumption at a hearing. The debtor needs to show a, a number of things including cure um, or adequate assurance of a prompt cure of defaults, an adequate assurance of a future performance, and the debtor um, also uh, has to assume all the burdens of the contract. If a debtor chooses to assume, it needs to do so in full. It can't cherry pick among the terms of the contract. As far as an assignment, we have the same issue there. The debtor needs to show adequate assurance of the assignee's ability to perform and certain contracts simply can't be assigned in bankruptcy. Those are um, particularly uh, personal service contracts and financial accommodation arrangements. They're unique and therefore not transferable rights. Um, adequate assurance of future performance is not defined in most instances, but it's worth knowing that if a debtor tenant wants to assume an, a relationship with its landlord at a shopping center, it has to show that assignment won't disrupt the tenant mix or the percentage rent. Um, as far as uh, whether you can prevent a debtor from assuming an, a contract, typically you can't. Um, bankruptcy doesn't recognize provisions and leases and contracts that make bankruptcy a default or that prohibit assignment. Um, with respect to rejection, just briefly on that, a debtor has to, again, file a motion to do so. Um, there is not particularly a standard in the bankruptcy co code that uh, sets forth when rejection is permissible, but courts have um, determined that the debtor's uh, reasonable business judgment is the basis upon which the debtor can decide to reject a contract. The court's not going to second guess a debtor who exercises discretion to reject in good faith. Um, as far as the damages, we touched on that. Uh, rejection gives rise to a pre-petition breach and a pre-petition claim for damages against the debtor's estate. In certain instances, those damages can be capped. Um, the example of that would be the 502b6 claim. Section 502b6 of the Bankruptcy Code um, caps the amount of the future damages that a landlord can collect on a particular formula that's set out in that code. It's essentially a force mitigation against the landlord to prevent the landlord with a claim for uh, future rents for property the debtor really never occupied to dilute the unsecured pool and maybe get, some, get more of its share than, than is thought to be deserved. Um, we could do a full program on just uh, executory contracts and leases alone, but um, uh, in this instance, we're able to cover those, those basic points for you. We want to shift focus now to some of the rights that are afforded a debtor regarding its property and bankruptcy, and that's um, the ability of the debtor, the right of the debtor, to use, lease, and sell its property and bankruptcy. Uh, a debtor is allowed to continue to use, lease, and sell its property as long as it follows the bankruptcy code to do that. Uh, use, lease, and sale in the ordinary course of business, there's no court approval that's required for that. Um, 
there is one exception worth noting in that cash collateral, a debtor is not entitled to use that without first obtaining court approval and affording adequate protection to the secured party for the use of that property. Cash collateral uh, consists of things like proceeds of the sale of a secured party's inventory or collection of a secured party's receivable. This is a unique ty type of property and it's capable of being dissipated uh, pretty readily. So the debtor has to account for that and protect the secured party's interest in that. Um, before using it. Ordinary course is not a concept that's defined, but if a debtor sells widgets, it's not going to be precluded from selling widgets. Uh, it can keep doing that. Um, as far as uh, sales outside the ordinary course of business, those are, item, those are matters that require a motion, uh, notice the parties and interest, and court approval um, of the process. Bankruptcy auctions are uh, typically sales of outside the ordinary course. A sale of all the debtor's assets free and clear of interest is something that uh, people on the call have probably heard of. The Section 363 sale is often referred to because that's the section of the code that gives rise to that right. And um, often Section uh, 363 sales, uh, sales of substantially all the debtor's assets take place in Chapter 11 cases too because um, parties, both debtor creditors and purchasers like the opportunity to take advantage of that remedy uh, in one forum to sell assets to the highest bidder. It's a better marketing option than perhaps uh, multi-state foreclosures that can take years to accomplish. The 363 sale can happen on a very fast track and there's substantial opportunity to maximize value as well. Um, when the assets are sold, uh, the liens that existed on the assets pre-sale then attach to the proceeds of the sale in the order of priority, and uh, in certain instances, parties can object to that sale of uh, assets, but um, there are bases to override those objections. For example, if the secured creditor will be paid in full from the proceeds of the sale, it really has no basis to object to the sale. So and I, think, I, I was going to say on the sales free and clear that it, it's also um, a tool that might be you know, desired by the, a potential purchaser for assets. They might prefer to uh, obtain you know, the uh, purchase of the assets from a debtor, debtor through a bankruptcy process because they can get it free and clear of, of potential claims that are associated with those assets. That's right. They can be in one forum. Hopefully all the creditors that have claims are there and the bankruptcy process allows uh, certain claims to be scraped off and the assets free and clear then to the purchaser. And in many Chapter 11 cases, um, the, the 363 sale can really be the end of the case. I mean, a, a fair number of cases there's a 363 sale and then a Chapter 11 case might be dismissed. Um, more often than not, there's still some um, some assets or some claims that still may, may need to be administered, but certainly um, the heat is taken off of a, a Chapter 11 case once there's no assets to actually or to, to assets to actually um, continue to operate a business with. Um, certainly, um, there's many cases that that go that direction where um, assets are sold and then the case might continue on just simply to administer a few claims and the few remaining assets that, that are there. Well, and you're going to talk about some of the assets that might be remaining, like the preferential transfers to recover or litigation that may be uh, worth pursuing after the primary assets are out of the estate. Certainly. Um, and I'm uh, right now I'm going to talk about um, potential claims and interests against a bankruptcy estate, and I'm going to cover this fairly briefly. I think um, for most people's perspective, if you're a creditor, I think one of the dates that uh, really do um, you do need to consider is going to be the claims bar date. Uh, claims bar date is established usually at the beginning of the case. It can be established later in the case. Um, once a trustee finds assets, notices are sent out that assets are available and that there will be um, claims administered and a date is set for a deadline uh, for filing claims. The proof of claim itself is really a fairly simple form that can be completed uh, oftentimes by with attaching you know relevant documents that would explain your would explain your claim. If I have a claim that's a little more complicated I'm helping with, sometimes I will include an explanation for what my claim is or an explanation of the documents that I'm attaching to support the claim. There are several types of claims that I wanted to highlight today as well. 
Um, and I'm going to do them, I think, kind of in order of, of uh, priority here. The bankruptcy code certainly establishes a hierarchy for claims. And I think at the top of that, at least with respect to the property that um, is subject to a lien, is certainly a secured claim. A secured claim is a claim that is secured by a lien on property of the debtor. So if the debtor owns a house, the mortgage company has a lien on it. That's a secured claim, at least up to the value of the house. Um, a claim can be um, both a secured claim and an unsecured claim also. So if the, uh, if the building that secures the claim is worth less than the obligation um, owed on the claim, um, the, the, there will be an undersecured claim. Um, certainly, uh, there's administrative expense claims as well, and administrative expense claims are actually treated outside of the claims process. These are really the expenses of the estate. The actual and necessary expenses of administering a bankruptcy case are treated at, at, a, at the highest level of priority. They're treated as administrative claims. Um, ordinary course administrative claims are going to be paid in the ordinary course if you're delivering goods to a debtor after a bankruptcy case. Um, the debtor should be paying for those uh, in the ordinary course. Um, there are certain uh, favored parties in the bankruptcy process that Congress has decided to treat with special priority. And those are called priority claims. And uh, there's probably no surprise to anybody here that taxes are included as priority claims because the government will want to get their, get, get their money um, certainly first. Other preferred um, groups or priority groups include um, employees, their wages, salaries, and benefits, and also certain support obligations are also going to be treated on a priority basis. This, I think, is primarily designed to um, buffer the effects of, of a bankruptcy filing. If, uh, if a company files for bankruptcy and, and a significant number of employees uh, maybe uh, come unemployed, there is a, a buffer here for those unemployed or, or soon to be unemployed uh, folks, and that's kind of the priority treatment for their wages. And also with the support obligations, certainly the, the filing of a bankruptcy by an individual who has support obligations would, would, could impact significantly on those obligations. Now, support obligations are not dischargeable by an individual, but also they are treated on it as a priority basis so that they're going to get paid first, and the idea being that you don't want a domino effect where a company files and then a bunch of individuals have to file because they've become unemployed. So hopefully this will buffer some of that effect. The kind of the bottom of the claim pile is the um, on general and secured claims. General and secured claims are just your standard claims, your contract claims, um, rejection damage claims. If, you're, if you have an executory contract that's rejected, it would also include uh, claims for, for torts if you're injured by uh, a debtor in an accident or something like that. That claim would, would fall within the category of an unsecured claim. And I, I shouldn't say the unsecured claims are necessarily at the bottom. Certainly at the very, very bottom are interests, which are not claims. Equity interests are really the shareholders of a company. And the shareholders are definitely at the bottom. The shareholders aren't going to get paid anything until the creditors get paid. Um, they, are, they are equity. They are not creditors, and creditors come before equity. Uh, those are really the, the, you know, the basic claims and the types of claims. And now in a chapter 11 in a chapter 11 case, those claims are going to be treated within uh, certain classes and typically those classes are going to kind of align with what those types of classes that I that I just discussed um, in a lot of larger chapter 11 cases those classes may be broke down a lot more um, a lot more than just those basics. But all the classes have to consist of substantially similar claims. If there's a reason for differentiating among classes, then that, that they can certainly be differentiated. But unsecured claims should be all be treated essentially the same. Um, in a Chapter 11 plan, this is going to be the, the end game for a Chapter 11 case where the Chapter 11 plan is proposed by a debtor or potentially by another party that will provide for how the debtor is going to either reorganize or liquidate and treat claims going forward. And it, within those classes, some of those classes are going to be impaired, which means they're not paid everything that they're owed. And other classes are unimpaired, and that means essentially you know, none of their rights are altered. They're going to be getting everything that they're entitled to. 
um, unimpaired classes are not permitted to vote on the plan. They're deemed to have accepted the plan. Impaired classes, on the other hand, are entitled to vote on the plan. And that process works through first the debtor or whoever proposes the plan, the plan proponent, uh, putting together a disclosure statement which provides adequate information or significant amount of information relating to the plan, <clears throat> the history of the case, and how the how the plan is going to impact and, on claims and how that plan is going to be put into effect. Once a disclosure statement is approved by the bankruptcy court, it's sent out with a solicitation package. So the debtors will or the debtors will send out um, really some of them can be very large booklets to creditors that would include the disclosure statement. It will also include a copy of the plan, and it will include a ballot that, if you're if the creditor is entitled to vote, the ballot will will authorize them to vote within within a certain class. So those impaired classes will vote on the plan, and the and the class is deemed to accept the plan. Uh, if uh, within that class uh, the respondents, um, at least half of the number of of respondents that cast the ballot vote to accept the plan and at least two-thirds in the dollar amount would accept the plan. So the plans, a plan class will vote for um, a plan if they like it. They may vote against it. Even if the, a particular class votes against the plan, a plan can still be confirmed over that uh, class over that class vote. Uh, at the confirmation hearing, which will occur after the balloting is all complete, the bankruptcy court will evaluate a plan to, to determine that it is consistent with the bankruptcy code and other non-bankruptcy law that's not impacted by the bankruptcy code. It will also evaluate the plan to make sure that the, uh, each holder of a claim is going to receive uh, at least as much as they would in a Chapter 7 liquidation case. That's called the best interest of creditors test. They'll determine that the plan is feasible, that it's not going to be followed or it's not likely to be followed by a uh, by further reorganization or or liquidation of the of the debtor that's not provided for in the plan. Um, as I indicated, they'll also confirm a plan. Typically, all classes must vote in favor of the plan, um, but at least one impaired class has to vote in favor of the plan. If one impaired class votes in favor of the plan, the plan can be crammed down over a no vote um, by another impaired class called a cram down because it's obviously it's a, a plan that's crammed down the throats of of um, creditors that have rejected the plan. Uh, it can be crammed down. There are certain protections provided, however, um, for those creditors that have voted against the plan, and that includes that the plan does not unfairly discriminate or against that class and also that that class is treated on a fair and equitable basis. For a secured creditor that would mean that the secured creditor gets to keep their lien and uh, will at least get paid the value of their property uh, over the course of the plan. For unsecured creditors that typically means that the creditor is going to get paid or um, that no creditor in a class that's junior to them will uh, get paid before they get paid. Um, that's called the absolute priority rule. And essentially, that means that shareholders are not going to get paid out of the, um, not going to get paid out of the plan until the general unsecured creditors are paid in full. There are certainly um, exceptions to all those, all those rules, and uh, the plan confirmation process is a complicated process, but uh, one that, that I think that that's as much as I can cover on it. After the plan is confirmed, um, on the effective date, the uh, debtor will either emerge from bankruptcy or they'll start the process of liquidating the company consistent with the plan, and that plan is really what governs the relationship of the debtor and creditor, at least with respect to their, their pre-bankruptcy uh, claims. Uh, that plan is going to govern the relationship between that debtor and creditor going forward. Um, Cheryl, I think that's really the end game for Chapter 11 cases, and I know you're going to talk about uh, I guess what I would call the end game for individuals.
That's right. Um, the discharge is yet another unique aspect of the bankruptcy process, and it's the end game for an individual debtor. For a Chapter 7, the discharge is uh, set forth in, in Section 727 of the Code. And again, we have the fresh start um, concept embedded in the bankruptcy. It's, it's uh, The discharge is what's given to the individual debtor for properly following the process of bankruptcy, appropriate honest disclosures, appropriate testimony at the 341, and so on. And the discharge is, is the result, it results from a discharge order that's entered after a particular time in the case, and it essentially provides that there's no liability of the debtor any longer for certain, most pre-petition debts, not all, but, but most. And um, once that discharge order is entered, it's important to, to note that um, there sanctions for violating it. Efforts to collect pre-filing debts then can result in sanctions uh, to, the, to the creditor who tries to pursue those debts. Um, compare for uh, the discharge uh, to an individual with the uh, plan injunction that's entered to um, uh, prohibit parties from seeking debts, uh, recovery of debts that are handled through the plan. So the discharge, again, is something an individual gets. Uh, it's not something an entity can get. And if there's a plan, there's a different, could be a, a different process for handling, um, handling the pre-petition debts. Um, certain debts are simply not dischargeable by their nature. Um, well, let me take a step back. There are some exceptions to discharge, and those include reaffirmation. In certain instances, a debtor can decide it wants to keep its pre-petition obligations in place, perhaps its car loan. And the debtor then takes certain steps under the bankruptcy code to reaffirm that debt, and then that debt survives the bankruptcy. There are certain actions that may bar a discharge, and there are certain actions that may cause the discharge that was granted to be revoked. And for the most part, those are actions that involve the dishonesty of the debtor. Um, and so a debtor can lose the benefits of the discharge by not by not abiding by the process properly. There are some debts that are non-dischargeable that survive by their nature, the discharge, and there are some that a creditor can have rendered non-dischargeable through certain processes in the bankruptcy court if it so determines to do so. Um, there has to be timely action taken to dispute the overall discharge from debts or the dischargeability of a claim, and essentially a creditor needs to file a, a lawsuit or an adversary proceeding in the bankruptcy to have um, the discharge barred or the dischargeability of a particular claim barred. Typically, that deadline's 90 days after the 341 meeting. Briefly, the, the kinds of debts um, that are non-dischargeable by their nature, again, we see the tax obligations protected, certain security fraud violations, again, the exercise of the police power, and then, um, you know, sometimes uh, certain domestic support obligations are non-dischargeable. Um, as far as debts that can be determined non-dischargeable by the filing of a complaint, uh, those are covered in Section 523 of the Code, and some examples are given on your slide. Uh, reliance on uh, false financial statements, breach of fiduciary duty, or defalcation, um, a, a breach of a trust relationship. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian again, and he's going to cover some different types of adversary proceedings that um, are unique aspects of bankruptcy as well. Yeah, briefly, I want to discuss avoidance actions, primarily because uh, any no uh, presentation on Bankruptcy 101 would be complete without at least acknowledging the existence of, of avoidance actions. Um, one type of avoidance action is a preference, and, and I'm also going to talk about fraudulent transfers. Very briefly, avoidance actions are brought within the bankruptcy case, usually as an adversary proceeding, that the trustee is going to uh, be bringing against people that received money prior to the bankruptcy case in order to get that money uh, back from that person in order to make a distribution to um, the creditors generally. The first type is a preference action. In a preference action, you would look back 90 days prior to the bankruptcy filing and determine whether any creditors received payments during that period of time. Um, now, this can be frustrating for creditors because this would mean that the creditor was paid on an account for which they were actually owed. So the debtor owes you money, the debtor pays you money that they owe you, and then they file for bankruptcy within that 90 days. There is a potential that the trustee could bring a cause of action against you so that you would have to give that money back. And then you would have to make a claim against the estate for that amount. Um, that can obviously be 
a fairly frustrating result for, for credit managers, but it is part of trying to make sure that the debtor didn't make any uh, preferred payments or didn't prefer any of the creditors um, that, that you know, may not have gotten paid during that 90-day period. There are defenses that, that help to kind of buffer the effect of preferences. One's the ordinary course of business defense. If the debt was incurred in the ordinary course and the uh, claim was paid in the ordinary course, then, then that payment may be able to be uh, protected. Subsequent new value and contemporaneous exchange for new value, those are typically kind of a, a netting effect so that if there was a, a transfer of money from the debtor to the creditor and then the creditor is also giving back, uh, you know, is delivering new product or um, new, new value to the debtor's estate, there's essentially a netting where there's no real negative effect on the estate. Um, so that those can be defenses to a preference. Uh, fraudulent transfers um, don't necessarily have to mean that there was a fraudulent intent involved. Certainly with an actual fraudulent transfer, there is a, an actual intent by the debtor to hide assets from creditors by transferring them. I mean, I think the classic example might be uh, for somebody to uh, transfer uh, their car to a, to a brother for, for, for nothing, for a very nominal, for very nominal consideration. Um, the, and if the, debtor was being pursued by creditors at the time that he made that transfer, you know, there might have been actual intent to try to hide that asset from, from those creditors. In the constructive fraudulent transfer uh, area, constructive fraud really looks at the effect of the transfer, much less, of, much less than at the intent of the, of the debtor in making the transfer. If the debtor receives less value, um, it doesn't receive reasonable equivalent value for the asset that's transferred. So in the example of the car, they transfer a $10,000 car for $100. That's not reasonably equivalent to value. Um, and if the debtor at the time of making the transfer was insolvent, th that um, transfer might be avoided as a fraudulent transfer. The trustee may be able to recover the car back or to recover the value of the car back from the brother-in-law that, that received the car. Um, and that way, enable the trustee to be able to make a fair distribution to the creditors that would have otherwise been entitled um, to uh, a distribution from the debtor. I think again, one of the, the highlights from um, you know any bankruptcy filing is really all everything kind of keys off of the petition date. And once a petition is filed and a creditor gets notice of the bankruptcy filing, that really does kind of um, a lot of things key off of that, such as the automatic stay, obviously deadlines to file uh, claims. Um, you'll get notice of when you need to when you need to file dischargeability actions. Right. A lot of dates and, and deadlines can flow off of that point. So once the notice is received, I think it's important that that people that receive those notices take some sort of action. I agree. It's the sort of the template to calendar all the events that flow from the petition evaluate your claims and what you need to do to protect your rights and interests when somebody files. I think the other thing about a bankruptcy, we touched on the two basic goals. When you keep those in mind, you're going to understand, um, you know, the executory contract process. People don't like the fact that a debtor can assume contracts, but the debtor has to cure and provide assurance of performance, and so um, it's a balance between the rights of debtors and creditors, and the same with the whole avoidance action thing. Um, you know, nobody likes to get a notice from the trustee to uh, pay back money, but um, it's an effort to keep creditors from uh, beating up on the debtor. Okay, Cheryl, I think we got um, one question here. I guess one question is whether there are fewer bankruptcies uh, with the new code. And by the new code, I think this person is probably referring to um, 2005. the 2005 mm -hmm. amendments of the bankruptcy code. Um, there was certainly a significant um, uptick in bankruptcies right before that right. went into effect. Um, since then, I think um, things have kind of um, – it's kind of roller coastered up and down. I mean, with with the way things have worked, certainly this last year, I would say in the last 12 months, um, all bankruptcies and all chapters are down significantly. I would also say that single asset bankruptcies are fewer because of the new 
uh, single asset real estate bankruptcies. There were certain laws that were enacted in 2005 in an effort to prevent abuses from those cases because they're not really well suited for bankruptcy in many instances. It's often a two-party dispute. You got the mortgagee and you got the you know the real estate asset and the debtor. And unless a debtor can uh, move quickly through to reorganization on a single asset real estate case. Um, there's going to be grounds for relief from stay or dismissal that case a lot sooner than other types of cases. So in response to that question, I, I would say that's a change that that um, impacted, the, number impacted of... the, the type of case and the type of case that's going to move, um, be required to move quickly through bankruptcy. If um, I don't think you see as many um, single asset real estate cases because of those rules. One other question we received is, is whether there was a stay on legal actions filed against a debtor prior to the bankruptcy filing. And Cheryl, this goes to the automatic stay that you discussed. Mm -hmm. And I know you covered that topic fairly, fairly quickly, but the short answer to that question is yes. If you have filed a cause of action against a debtor, uh, that cause of action is going to be is going to be stayed by the automatic stay. One area where I have um, sought relief in, in a few cases, and it's definitely the exception, not the rule, is where that litigation has advanced significantly. It may be possible to get relief from state or cause because you'll want to liquidate your claim uh, either in the bankruptcy court or in that other non-bankruptcy forum. And if it makes more sense to liquidate that case in the non-bankruptcy forum because it's advanced so far in the litigation, mm -hmm. you, you may that, that may be a, a for getting relief, that's not the. I would say that's the exception to the rule, not not the rule. Um, and also, um, I've seen uh, situations that we've done this as well, where you seek relief from stay in order to go against insurance proceeds that are available. Um, you're not going against assets of the estate. That's the theory. The insurance proceeds are really outside of the estate, and you may have a basis to go forward with a state court action that being covered by insurance. And one, um, and that would include pretty much, you know, no matter where that claim might have been filed, the, the stay is going to apply um, for certain, and you need to make sure that that you stop actions in that cause of action. Um, there are um, within the exceptions to the automatic stay where there might be a repeat filer. Um, there are instances in which you know, an individual may file bankruptcy repeatedly and have those cases dismissed and then file it again. Uh, there are instances where the uh, automatic stay would automatically terminate within 30 days for a repeat filer. Or there might be, if they've filed, I think, more than three times, I'm going to say it's the fourth time, mm -hmm. um, and I, it might do the third or fourth time, um, the automatic stay would not apply at all unless the debtor goes in and asks for it to be applied. So, I mean, those might be examples where if you're engaged in litigation and you have a repeat filer that is, is continuously filing bankruptcies and having those dismissed that might disrupt the flow of your litigation, once they filed a certain number of times, it's going to have less and less effect as it's gone. Yeah, that's right. There are definitely rules that we didn't get to and couldn't cover in detail that would address abusive practices. and. Um, those rules might serve as a basis to step outside the automatic stay. They might also um, be a basis outside the discharge. You can't file bankruptcy repeatedly and still the benefits of the discharge. There are certain time frames that have to pass um, to enable you to, to get those rights and remedies again. So, I think that's uh, all, all we're going to have time for questions. If anybody has any questions, certainly you can um, contact Cheryl or I um, after the program. We're happy to, we're we're happy happy to address those questions. Yeah cover any more questions you may have uh, offline after this uh, program concludes. And we really do thank you for joining our program. It's been a privilege to present it to you. And uh, have a great rest of the day and a great rest of the week. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.